Hello everyone this is part 14 of what if Deku was the chainsaw man, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to share, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. Join my membership the perks are great, it's in the description. Five minutes prior to the quake that Shigaraki and Chisaki felt from within their underground meeting place, an aircraft came into radius from high above. A tri-motor plane provided by the HPSC flew just above the cloudy atmosphere, unseen by the naked eye of anyone down below. On board the carrier were two particular passengers. Within the aircraft's cargo area, Izuku Midoriya and the boy Izuku has come to know as Mirio Togata, both prepared for the bay door to open. Wind flew out as much as air rushed in, the harsh exposure having whipped them hard. Nevertheless, they withstood the pressure pushing past their respective blonde and green hair. Mirio's cape flapped as he stepped forward first. He's lucky his visor serves as a pair of goggles, since there was then no need for him to squint when staring down at the Yakuza facility that had been beneath him. Then, without a parachute, the boy jumped. He didn't need one. Pure power coursed throughout the blonde's body as he nosedived in a straight plummet for Earth's ground. Veined muscles glowed with an electrical aura so bright that it shone through the material of his hero uniform. Mirio's fist flew faster than he did when he finally came into contact with the Yakuza base. Upon touchdown, on a scale equivalent to All Might, he blew away half of the infrastructure while simultaneously creating a crater. Izuku was the only one able to bear witness to the display of sheer power. While none of the Yakuza would ever know what hit them, Izuku would. He's probably the only one that ever will. A secret entrusted to him some time ago, a quirk that had originally been offered to him, Mirio is none other than All Might's successor. Only Izuku could recognize that this must be the case. He shook off his stupor before following after. Though his departure from the aircraft was of a different method's nature. It was just as cool in its own right. Neater than using a parachute, at least. With the aid of David Shield's invention for him, Izuku followed suit. There was no need for him to transform as he made his descent. Not when he's driving a supersized chainsaw fitted to be the base of a motorcycle. A hump in the bike arched Izuku forward on the ride down to join Mirio, jostling him as much as a camel would. Both of the boy's hands clung to the handle grips as he revved the vehicle's engine. The exhaust pipe released a trail of fumes that spiraled as the motorcycle twisted. A nosedive much like Mirio's brought the bike headfirst to a point with its front-facing chainsaw. A sharp collision not as destructive as All Might's successor but still explosive, smashed right behind the first impact crater. Smoke envelops their entry point, concealing the direct causation momentarily. Mirio and Izuku both share a set of goofy grins when they glance at each other. An unspoken agreement that they had done something awesome settles with the dust around them. The duo landed in a maze of tunnels, the real evil lair of the Yakuza. This whole operation having been a premeditated strike, they already knew about it. That's what the dive bomb had been all about. Push past the front forces with a show of strength and then proceed with the raid. The two give one another a nod before heading in opposite directions to officially begin their mission. Izuku drives through his side of the labyrinth, hitting a button on his bike as he does. A signal strong enough to reach from underground contacts Sir Naitea and his agency. The plan is to now be tracked from the surface to a separate point of entry where more heroes can join him and Mirio. Makima had the hero commission set up roadblocks under the guise of construction so that Naitea will be able to drill in when they find a good spot. Thanks to the thick barrier walls surrounding the Yakuza base, nobody will be aware of the tactical strike as opposed to what could have been a full frontal assault. Mirio even has his own tracker, scouting ahead on his side of the maze to do the same for Naitai's agency. Mirio zooms through the halls of the Yakuza tunnel system, a trail of lightning streaking behind him as much as his cape flaps. Until, he comes upon a set of two from Chisaki's eight bullets. If Naitai's report was correct, the one with a torn plague mask is Kendo Rapper and his pal in the Yukata is Hekiji Tengai. Mirio places his feet firmly, stopping suddenly in his tracks. His gloved hands form a pair of fists. Move or be moved, the priority of the mission makes him stand bold in the face of this deadly duo. Rapper takes an eager stomp towards Mirio, no doubt grinning beneath his mask. 
Ho ho, this one wants a fight. The Yakuza forms his own set of fists while taking a boxing stance. His muscles pulsate to a size that rivals his opponent's. But Tengai stops his ally with an outstretched arm before a fight can break out. Remember our spear and shield formation? The villain speaks coolly with a level voice while gauging Mirio, we should be wise about this rather than simply rushing in. Gar, it's just one guy, though Rapper doesn't quite care to remain rational. He pushes past his partner's arm and advances towards Mirio. The Yakuza takes a swing at his opponent, but the fist doesn't connect. Rapper punches through the hero, and not in the gory kind of way, but in a way that makes him stumble while losing balance. Wah, the villain's confused shout as he looks back is met with the sight of Mirio phasing forward. Turning tangible again, it's Mirio's turn to throw a punch. Even when holding back, it's a blow strong enough to knock Rapper out cold. Tengai reacts with a disgruntled gasp before creating his signature quirk barrier. It's supposed to be a powerful defense to shield against powerful attacks. Maybe Mirio's power passed down from All Might is just too much for it. The barrier breaks easily and Tengai goes down just as easy too. The one for all successor strikes a triumphant pose, victorious in the face of villains. Meanwhile, Izuku keeps driving his chainsaw cycle down a long corridor. Pointed treads carry him along until he reaches a fork in the path. Izuku breaks. The engine rumbles as it waits to be reignited. But this seems like as good a spot as any. The bike sends out a second signal so that Naitaye knows where to drill and drop down. Through a manhole under the guise of construction workers, backup burrows into the ground of the sewer. Bubble Girl, who turns out to be more than just a secretary, hops through their entry hole first. Followed by Centipede and then Naitaye himself. Good work, Midoriya. We'll take it from here, Centipede pats Izuku on the shoulder. But the U.S. student turned HPSC operative shakes his head. My work's not done just yet, he glances down one of the hallways that they have to choose from, you may as well make use of me while I'm here. He's right, Naitaye solely uses his index finger to push his glasses back up the bridge of his nose while staring down the opposite hall, it makes no sense to split up when we can cover just as much ground this way. But, Centipede is about to protest. Until Izuku's chainsaw cycle overlaps the hero's voice with an abrasive roar from its engine. Izuku is already speeding down the hall before Centipede can get another word out. Bubble Girl grabs Centipede by the arm, steering him away from chasing after the boy. He may look like a kid, Centipede, but we have to remember who he works for. Her downcast gaze matches Night Eye's demeanor as she pulls her fellow agency member with her. Izuku revs the engine of his motorcycle, urging it to go faster. He can see a hooded Yakuza up ahead thanks to their white raincoat contrasting the tunnel's dark shading. If he remembers correctly, this guy is probably Chronostasis. When something sharp swings out from under the villain's hood, Izuku dispatches himself from his bike. In one fluent motion, Izuku flips above the needled spire of hair that slices his chainsaw cycle down the middle. He undoes his button shirt by yanking at the cloth to rip it apart, then he tugs on his sternum string. Chainsaws sprout from each end of the boy's arms while a longer protrusion extends out of his head. Izuku's skull shields itself by morphing into a mechanical mouthful of fangs. He smacks down against the floor by springboarding with a knee to roll himself over on one shoulder, the HPSC operative writes himself to a standing position at the end of the falling flow. Izuku's arms chop into a clash of chainsaws as his tongue rolls out of his mouth. You wrecked my ride, you jerk. You're gonna have to pay for that, his bladed rotors rev louder than the motorized cycle's single saw had. So bothersome, Chronostasis extends his locks of hair so that they spring forth again. This time, the needles spear towards Izuku directly. The boy blocks one before deflecting the other, chainsaws surprisingly not cutting through the durable follicles. Even odder, Izuku's movements start becoming a bit duller after that. He's unable to move fast enough to avoid one of the hair extensions swatting him across the chest. Izuku takes a sluggish step back. Suddenly, the needle-shaped hair makes sense. The Yakuza's locks resemble clock hands. Chronostasis's quirk must have something to do with slowing him down. Izuku grits his pointed teeth. He'll just have to make the chains on his saws rotate faster then. He pulls on his ripcord to rev them up. Dude, you look like you could use a haircut. The added spin to the blades helps him chop through the needles this time. 
Chronostasis cries out when he sees his opponent pushing forward. His last resort is to reach for the pistol he keeps concealed under his raincoat. But his hand never makes it to the holster. Izuku cuts the villain's hand off at the wrist before delivering a kick to the man's temple. Down goes the Yakuza. Izuku licks his metallic muzzle, saliva dripping out of his mouth when he spits on the unconscious criminal. A soft squeak makes Izuku spin swiftly, chainsaws reigniting at the hint of a possible threat. What he finds instead partway down the hall is a steel door that's partially cracked open. Peering through the slight slither between corridor and entrance are young innocent eyes, eyes that are brimming with tears. It takes a second to register in his head, but Izuku realizes that this must be the young girl that the Yakuza are keeping captive here. She's scared out of her wits, pulling the door completely closed to hide despite having already given herself away. Izuku looks down at his flesh-shredded arms from which chainsaws protrude, no wonder the girl was terrified of him. After a moment's hesitation, he retracts the chainsaws and reverts his facial transformation back to its usual freckled form. The damage has already been done but the least he can do is try to look less scary for her. A sad sigh escapes his lips when he looks back at his handiwork, chronostasis bleeds from his nub. Then he heads for the steel door. Mirio would be much better for this part but it's not like he can leave the girl here for somebody else. He has to suck it up. He breathes in and then out. Hand on the handle, turn it so that it clicks open. Sharper than nails on a surface more durable than a chalkboard, a shrill scrape of steel against stone pierces Izuku's ears. Katanas drag themselves against the ground, pointed ends of the blades digging into the cement. Grooves trail behind in a jagged line from each protrusion, only getting longer and longer as they continue cutting a path. Stopping short, Izuku takes his hand off the door handle, letting the door click back into a complete closure. He starts by turning his head first, gauging the approaching figure at the end of the hall. When he gets an eyeful of something not part of the Yakuza, he completely twists his body to fully face this new foe. Towering over him, despite its back being hunched over, is a creature of demonic design. What makes this thing more haunting than the Nomis though, is that it bears a striking resemblance to him when he transforms. Katanas are an extension of its very being, blades erecting from each of its arms and the base of its exposed skull. Black cloth hangs from its form, a dark trench coat covering the rest of its body. A voice that sounds as malformed as it looks whispers a single word. Fake. I'm the fake, Izuku chokes on his own disbelief. He can't help but nervously laugh. Whatever the hell this thing is, it must be some sort of joke. You're the one ripping off my image, he already knows to reach for the string attached to his sternum before bothering to engage in a challenge to prove that though. Too bad this katana man cuts to the chase a little quicker. An uptake of the monster's arm swings a sword across Izuku, chopping the fingers off the hand that reaches for his ripcord before any of them can pull it while simultaneously slashing the boy's chest. Blood pulls out from the fresh cut before a secondary splash surges from Izuku's gaping mouth. Izuku flings himself back on reflex, making his rival only marginally miss him by a hair's width when another katana limb swipes at him to finish what was started. Izuku fumbles, nearly falling over. He twists his ankle catching himself and then shoves the rest of his body back, dodging a third attack from Katana Man. His copycat clearly isn't playing around. Izuku dives forward to move over a fourth swing from the bladed limbs. Before he reconnects with the ground though, he takes this as a chance to reach for his ripcord with his other hand. Fingers still attached to that one, Izuku yanks hard on the string. Chainsaws erupt from the boy's body just in time for them to meet his doppelganger's blades in a clash. Katana man presses into him, not allowing Izuku to plant his feet. The chainsaw boy is forced to move, shoes skidding across the floor. It's a charge that carries them both down the corridor opposite to Chronostasis' unconscious body. Sparks light the hall while chainsaw teeth grind against sharpened edges of katanas. A shriek of blades crossing in a match of strength carries down the tunnel. Izuku leans in, ducking his head down. So does Katana Man. The weapons mounted to their skulls collide with equal force to the ones meeting at the middle of their struggle. At the end of the hallway, the steel door that they left behind gradually reopens. The cement space creaks like wood, a gale of wind amplified by an electrical current creating a column of air that does the opposite of supporting the underground infrastructure. Sweeping through the tunnel is pure power channeled through a one-for-all generated blow. 
All Might's successor stands with his fist raised, a spitting image of the hero, albeit the cape added to his costume billowing an extra personal touch. He just blasted away another member of Chisaki's eight bullets, this one a criminal capable of covering his body in crystal. The diamond armor wasn't enough to withstand the sheer strength of Mirio's punch though. The hard layer shattered on impact, and the ensuing wind gust carried the Yakuza's unconscious body down the hall. When Mirio lowers his arm to see past his own fist, his yellow visor allows him to see a second enemy coming through the smoke clearing his attack created. This one also wears a plague mask, though the small beak doesn't quite match the man's behemoth body. A hulking figure of solid muscle that could rival All Might and Endeavor combined in a bodybuilding compion stomps forward. Few as thick as the Yakuza's skin stretches the material of his tank top. Mirio raises a single brow. This guy looks like he can take a hit better than the last few villains. The bulkish brute brings his fists together, metal gauntlets igniting sparks when the knuckle dusters collide with each other. Mirio moves first, channeling another kinetic charge of one for all throughout his body. When he invades the villain's space, he brings his fist up into the Goliath's stomach. He can tell by the way that the Yakuza hunches over, his hit knocks the man's wind out of him. But the criminal is quick to recover, retaliating by wrapping his colossal arms around Mirio while they're still close together. He squeezes, constricting his bulky biceps so that they crush the young hero. If Mirio weren't countering with his own strength, he'd surely have gotten a few bones broken to say the least. The two struggle in a brief grapple against their shows of force. While wrestling though, the performance between each opponent soon becomes a little more challenging for All Might's successor. Mirio feels his energy dwindling, and not just because of how much of it he's exerting to challenge the Yakuza. The young hero recalls his mentor's reports, this is another member of Chisaki's eight bullets, Riki Akatsukum, and he has a quirk that helps him siphon stamina from anyone that he touches. So long as he stays locked in this stalemate of strength, he's going to have all of his power drained from him. Mirio calls upon his original quirk, before receiving one for all, and phases free from Katsukum's vice grip. The Goliath is left hugging himself when the blonde backs away to catch his breath. They pause, but then, Mirio gasps when he realizes that the energy he had sapped from him was added to his enemy's supply, Katsukum has somehow gotten bigger. The Yakuza heaves a hefty left at Mirio, forcing the young hero to duck down and dodge. Mirio darts between the Hulk's legs, using the space between them to regain some leverage in their fight. You're a big guy but I'll bet you still skip leg day like the rest of us, he knows Naitaye would have appreciated the quip as he brings an elbow down on Katsukum's calf. The villain grunts, bristling against the blow, but his knees don't buckle. Okay, maybe you don't skip, Mirio has to reconsider his evaluation of the brute when he's nearly backhanded by a meaty arm. All Might's successor slides back, somewhat startled by his enemy's display of power. Katsukum swings two giant fists at Mirio, making the young hero swerve to avoid being struck by them. The blonde counters with a strike to the Yakuza's side, eliciting another groan from the villain. But Mirio doesn't stop there. He pushes to slam into the behemoth again and again. Blow after blow, Katsukum starts shifting slowly to a kneeling position. Mirio breathes a sigh of relief, seeing that he's making some headway. That is, until the Yakuza makes a wild grab for the young hero and gets his grubby mitts on him. Mirio fights the hold his enemy has on him before using permeation to slip through the villain's fingers. Except, by then, Mirio is much too late. Katsukum has already siphoned off another bout of energy. Mirio steps back in, delivering a strike to the brute's solar plexus. While Katsukum does budge, he's still able to retaliate with his own punch. Ha! The behemoth boasts when he sends the young hero flying through the air. Mirio tumbles across the tunnel a bit before stopping his roll by planting his hands into the ground. He shakes his head, trying to shake off the hit. At least, with a gap between them now, the blonde sees he has a runway for a supercharged attack. One for all courses through his system, just a little more than he typically uses. His legs prime themselves before he pushes off. Mirio's cape flaps behind him as he flies forwards. Katsukum barely braces for impact when they collide with one another. A rush of air force plows down the hall, pressure accolating into their tackle until they're rocketing like a bullet. Smashing through a couple layers of cement walls with unprecedented speed is jarring to say the least. 
the two dispel from each other as they continue the destructive journey within the Yakuza's maze. What brings the crashing mess of fumbling fighting to a stop is Katsukum slamming into a sprawled starfish shape. Mirio lands on top of the behemoth's belly, also winded from the battle. Rubble rushes down around them, a trail of debris and dust still settling. The young hero's coughs indicate he's still conscious while the villain's silent sleeping indicates unconsciousness, the victor has been decided. Except, when Mirio pushes himself over the Yakuza's body to land on the ground, he doesn't feel very victorious. The room where he winded up isn't an empty one. Kai Chisaki himself is seated across the way, looking none too pleased. And right across from the young head of the Yakuza is who Mirio can only presume must be the leader of the League of Villains. All Might's successor stands on his feet, brushing himself off from the grime of his entrance. It looks like things are only getting started here. Mirio cracks his neck side to side, preparing for another bout of battling a tough enemy or two. There's still someone for all left in him to go around, pure power crackling as it starts to regenerate itself. Chisaki pushes himself up from his seat to challenge Mirio's stance with his own. You've really made a mess of things, he grumbles behind his beak-shaped mask but it's difficult to tell who he's referring to when his gaze is cast down instead of at either Mirio or his fellow villain. He picks at the edges of his wrists, a gesture Mirio can only interpret as meaning trouble will occur when the man's gloves come off. The blue-haired villain beside him begins backing away, seemingly sensing some of that same danger. Mirio tenses when purple fog surrounds the league leader. Maybe, but nobody likes a neat freak, it's not until it's too late that Mirio realizes that dark smoke is a warp gate to help the man escape. All Might's successor returns his focus to Chisaki, not willing to let another bad guy go if he can help it. Chisaki sighs, sliding one of his gloves off. Like I said, such a mess, and much to Mirio's credit, nothing can prepare him for what happens after that. The trio of Naitae, Centipede, and Bubble Girl come to an abrupt halt. Their trip through the Yakuza's underground tunnels has led them to what one might consider a dead end. An open space lit with a chandelier is occupied by villains playing poker around a wood table. Most of the men are wearing masks befitting of plague doctors but there are others who break that mold like one with a burlap sack over their head. One with a bowler hat stands up to greet the heroes, well, what do we have here? Some uninvited guests. I wasn't aware there were invites, Bubble Girl swallows a lump in her throat while trying to ease the tension of the situation with a joke. She anxiously glances between her boss and her fellow sidekick, sweat dripping down her forehead. Centipede plays along, I suppose that makes us party crashers then, hoping to quell some of the girl's nerves while simultaneously hiding his own. He finds himself gazing at his boss too, seeking instruction from the hero. In that case, Naitea carefully gauges the Yakuza that outnumber him and his sidekicks with a calculative stare. It's not like retreat is much of an option. He pulls his tie loose to let his neck breathe a bit. And then cracks his knuckles. Let's crash as a party. The room may as well becomes a disorienting dance floor. Suddenly dizzy, the three heroes stumble with misplaced footing. A man in a mask fitted with drains leaks alcohol from its eye holes as he jumps into action, sure. Come join us. There's plenty of booze to go around, he carries with him a bottle that sloshes just as much beer. A round of miniature projectiles plow into the drunken Yakuza. Their hyperdensity metallic seals, practically shurikens, and they shatter the villain's mask along with his bones. Even with his accuracy somewhat off kilter, Naitea still managed to get his aim right. The Yakuza's quirk had been what was dizzying the heroes, its effects wearing off now that the man is down. Get them, Naitea stops the funny business and gets to work. I've got the little one, Bubble Girl leaps for a shorter Yakuza in a black jumpsuit. She wraps the villain in a hug, clinging to him so that he doesn't wriggle free. But it turns out that the small stature was merely a disguise to fool her. A muscular arm bigger than both of her own put together bursts loose from the Yakuza's leather onesie to grab the girl's throat. She's hoisted into the air as she's choked, okay, maybe I don't. Bubble Girl, Centipede shifts his focus to his colleague when he sees her in trouble. But he currently has problems of his own, too busy to rescue her. A blonde Yakuza hacks at the sidekick with a katana, forcing Centipede to dodge and swerve in the direction opposite to his ally. Hang on, Centipede cries out in desperation as he tries to push past his opponent. 
but Naitie is already coming to Bubble Girl's aid, driving a foot into her assailant's beaked face. Don't be distracted from your own fights, he warns his sidekicks to stay on the guard before dodging an attack from the burlap baddie. The scarecrow villain snaps at Naitie, nearly biting the hero's head off. All right, Bubble Girl rubs the sore spot around her neck as she tries to recover and return to the battle. No doubt, regardless of her already blue pigmented skin, that's gonna leave a bruise. She returns the favor by punching the jerk that gave her that mark. His neck twists with the blow despite his now revealed muscular form. Centipede dodges another swing from his enemy's sword. The sidekick's insectoid arms elongate, winding to wrap the villain up. But the Yakuza foresees his capture, retaliating with a swift strike of his blade. Centipede cries out as his arms are chopped off. Bubble Girl pauses to check on him, screaming with horror of her own when she sees his dismemberment. Naitie spares a glance but doesn't waver when he's rushed by the scarecrow villain again. The hero instead demonstrates his grief with an angry blow to the burlap baddie's face. Enough of this, the bowler hat Yakuza draws a handgun. A deafening crack of a bullet leaving its barrel echoes throughout the underground hall. Bubble Girl's brains blow out the back of her head as she's shot down. Her body hits the floor the way a paint bucket would clatter and spill. Naitie utters a noise of distress but is forced to push his feelings aside when the Yakuza redirects their pistol on him. Naitie grabs for the blonde villain with the katana, using the Yakuza as a human shield as gunfire rains down on him. Their bodies topple over from the recoil of the shots, which leaves the armless centipede to charge the bowler hat villain in a last-ditch effort to shift the tides back in the hero's favor. Unfortunately, there's just enough bullets left in the Yakuza's pistol to gun down Centipede too. What a mess they made, the Yakuza grumbles as he lowers the smoking pistol. He's just about to turn and head out for reinforcements when he sees the corpse of his fallen ally wobbling. Naitie tosses the body he used as a shield off of himself, covered in blood from the gunshots but none of which is his own. Ah, damn, the remaining Yakuza faces the remaining hero. It's a race between who can reload the gun before the other stands up. Then it's a race between who can reach the other first, bullet or fist. Naitai's knuckles scrape the villain's masked face as he's shot through the shoulder. They both take a spill, falling to the floor. The Yakuza's weapon clatters as it carries itself away from the two fighters. Naitai throws another punch that shatters a lens on the villain's plague doctor mask. They roll over, landing on top of each other. Naitie screams as the villain digs a thumb into his bullet wound. The hero grabs at the Yakuza's face, gripping it firmly as he drives his own thumb through the eye hole he broke and into the man's socket. Blood-curdling shouts reverberate throughout the chamber as they both wrestle against one another. Naitie drives a fist into the Yakuza's stomach. The Yakuza throws a punch into the hero's mouth. Naitie tumbles when he's thrown from the villain. The Yakuza got the best of him. He chokes on his own blood, but levels his blurry gaze on the villain ever still. When the hero's vision focuses on the gun that he landed next to instead, he swallows some of the copper taste in his mouth. Naitie grabs the pistol and raises it up. It may be a second of hesitation or a second of setting the gun straight for accuracy, but it's after that second that Naitie pulls the trigger and kills the Yakuza. Naitai's hand trembles, but his grip on the gun remains firm. He's surrounded by bodies and blood two of which are his sidekicks. Unsure of how he can call himself a hero with that being the case, he releases a roar of anguish. This whole operation was his idea and he knows that if he hadn't rushed it, if he had waited for the proper reinforcements, that maybe things would have gone differently. Overcome with guilt, the man folds over and breaks down in despair. A whirlwind of blades clashing shatters a wall of cement, chainsaw man and katana man flying from tunnel to tunnel. The flow from which they move carries a continuous momentum, one that keeps them airborne so long as they propel from hallway to hallway. Corridor after corridor combusts when they collide with each wall. Pebbles pelt Izuku when he braces against a katana with an arm bar. The boy flings his other chainsaw limb upwards to scrape against his opponent's head-mounted sword. They twist with cutting motions before breaking apart. What's the matter? I thought you were gonna cut me down. Izuku goads his enemy as he prepares a trap. A trick he's been honing that proved easier to pull off when in enclosed spaces like alleys or hallways comes in clutch. He unlatches the chains from his arm bars so that they spiral out and ensnare his doppelganger. 
A wave of nausea hits Izuku, right before the katana creature cuts itself free with a flex of its bladed arms. That rush of an unease, though weaker, felt familiar. When Katana Man crouches to take a form that also seems similar to another swordsman he fought, it clicks. That was bloodlust. This is a Nomu version of, Stain, Izuku chokes on his own gasp of shock when the modified hero killer slashes through his stomach. In it spill out of Izuku's gut, his torso nearly torn in two. He staggers while maintaining the fading feeling of his consciousness. His fingers fidget as they twitch towards his ignition cord. Stain turns back towards the boy, reassuming his same posture that comes before a deadly dash. See, come on. Let's ban that move, Izuku can't pull his starter string without a set of digits. His hand flies off with the rest of his arm, severed from his body. Izuku drops to his knees, vision blurring as he begins to blink out the hall's dim light. He's running out of time to reach for his ripcord. He still has his other hand. Except, he doesn't. When he tries grabbing at his sternum, he can't feel either arm anymore. Katana Man must have come back and cut off the other limb while he was falling down. There's not much hope left for him when Stain crosses his blades to make a scissor formation at the boy's throat. Izuku kicks out, sweeping his leg as a Hail Mary, a chainsaw bursting forth to slice at Stain's knees. Katana Man trips thanks to the sneak attack, letting Izuku keep his head a while longer. Long enough to reach for his starter string with his tongue. A blade swoops up and detaches the boy's elongated tongue before it can make contact. Izuku spits out saliva coupled with blood, surprised that what had quickly been becoming a signature move was disrupted. Katana Man sits across from Chainsaw Man, both of them staring as they seep blood into a collective puddle. The brief break is over. Stain swings a bladed arm at Izuku, forcing the boy to roll out of the way. A clamor of steel against stone echoes when the sword misses. Izuku lays on his back, breathing becoming ragged, the floor isn't so hard, it's quite comfortable enough to fall asleep on actually. He shakes his head, waking himself up. He can't lose consciousness. Not yet. He tries using his chin to snag the handle of his starter string, hoping the metal point will be enough to catch it. A katana slides straight through Izuku's chest. Followed by another. The boy yells to express his pain when the blades hoist his skewered body up. It's clear to him now that Stain had been holding back when they had their first fight, when the hero killer was in his right mind. Now that Stain has been genetically modified into a monster though, as a Nomu, those self-imposed limits have been removed. Katana Man is the real deal and Chainsaw Man hadn't been prepared for it. He's about to die. Katana Man slides a katana out from Izuku's chest, eliciting more than just an agonized grunt. The blade draws back, readying to spear the boy through his skull next. But just as he prepares to deliver the finishing blow, Stain gets disrupted. A pebble pelts the back of the Nomu's head. Katana Man stops short. Briefly, Izuku hopes the rock is somehow enough to defeat the villain the same way that Brick during their first fight had. But he knows that's more than wishful thinking. The pebble serves simply as a distraction. Katana Man releases Izuku, the boy's body sliding off his bladed arm and hitting the floor. Before turning to face who dare cast stones at him. The little girl that the Yakuza has been holding captive trembles under the monster's looming form. Izuku opens his mouth but barely an exhale escapes as he struggles to simply breathe. He can't warn her. He can't yell at her to run. His dismembered body refuses to move, a state of paralysis overcoming him as fatigue sets in. He's forced to lay there on the filthy floor and watch as a monster of his own design steps towards the girl to slay her. Or maybe he spoke too soon. His vision is getting darker. Too dark to see. Maybe he'll die first. The Yakuza's prisoner backpedals, preparing to flee when she sees nobody will be coming to her rescue. Except, her bare feet aren't bandaged like the rest of her body and those exposed souls step on sharp shards of stone. She falls, shouting. Katana Man towers over the child, blades shimmering under the dark tunnel's dim lighting. The girl squeezes her eyes shut, bracing for the familiar sensation of pain she's experienced too many times before. When death doesn't come, she slowly reopens them. A wisp of purple smoke billows between her and the bladed beast. Out from the plume of purple pigmentation, emerges the League of Villains leader. Shigaraki surveys the scene, disregarding the child with a scoff but then spotting Izuku Midoriya's corpse. 
The blue-haired fiend steps a little closer to the young hero's body, red eyes marveling at what his creation managed to do. Well done, his scarred lips curve into a smirk, very well done, he nudges Izuku's limp form with his foot, checking to see if the boy is truly dead. When he confirms that the kid is a goner, he gestures for what's proven to be a superior pet to follow him back through Kurogiri's warp gate. Now that we're finished here, let's go home. Katana Man obediently walks with his creator through the portal. Then, as quickly as the villains had arrived before the little girl's eyes, they vanish without a trace. She's left alone with the boy who had been sliced and diced to little less than pieces. The girl gradually crawls towards the body, sniffling as she fights back tears. He had looked scary but she saw how he stopped the beaked man who always hurt her. She thinks maybe this boy isn't as bad as the bladed monster or any of those other guys. Her hands hover above him, wavering as she tries to discern what to do. Her quirk, even though the doctors tell her it's a disease, has helped heal and revive like Chisakis. He told her to stop or else she'd be hurt as punishment but she remembers she was able to do it. Maybe there's a way to reverse the damage to the boy. Her eyes widen, noticing something interesting. She sees a string swaying from his chest. He's turned over, the wire dangling. She doesn't have anything like that on her. Maybe, she taps the top of her head, where a small horn is. Maybe that string is like her horn. She grabs the tiny handle with her equally small-sized hands and pulls. The floor has become a sea of spikes that collide with one another in rapid succession, sharp waves of stone spiraling from every direction. Mirio has only managed to survive thanks to a combination of permeation phasing him through it all and one for all enhancing his endurance. He zips from spot to spot in an effort to escape the onslaught of cement spires, still trying to dodge them regardless of his ability to pass through the attacks, after all, he needs an opening somewhere in order to turn tangible and retaliate, the point of persisting in battle otherwise pointless. Regardless, Chisaki's reassembly of the underground chamber is a complete overhaul to the environment. This is the Yakuza leader's home turf now more than ever. Mirio uses permeation to survive being crushed by two slabs of stone slamming together, sandwiching him in the middle. When the blonde passes through and comes back out into the open, he's met by another wave of sharpened ground. Rather than phasing again, he meets the attack with a strike of his own. A one-for-all generated fist punches a hole through the floor and shatters the already fragmented features like glass. Chisaki controls the equilibrium with two ungloved hands pressed against the ground, contorting the chamber so that he's raised out of reach onto a platform. Ripples of erosion careen across the ruptured terrain, intended to topple the tunnel and bury Mirio. Except, the young hero still has a youthful burst of energy left in his reserve, the kind that helps him to use the cement-covered tidal wave as a launch pad for liftoff. He thrusts a fist forward to smash through the first barrier Chisaki throws up, spinning so that his momentum carries him further, and delivers a second punch into the second shield of stone. Debris litters the labyrinth as he flies upwards. Mirio blows away another layer of manipulated material before landing on top of the Yakuza leader's self-made platform. You're not getting away that easily, Mirio grins ear to ear as he writes himself to oppose the villain. Chisaki may as well be facing All Might himself while he's still in his prime. The young hero clenches each hand to form fists, preparing to punch his way forward again. More fluctuation of the floor ensues, warding the blonde off. Your kind disgusts me, Chisaki hisses with contempt as he watches his attacks counted time and time again, you're a disease that needs to be purged. The way Mirio maintains a smile, triumphant to the bitter end even when things are at their most critical, it drives Chisaki berserk. The walls warp and the ceiling collapses, encasing All Might's successor in a tomb of the Yakuza's design. There's no plowing his way out of this one. Mirio phases through the ground that continuously reapplies itself until he surpasses its reach. Breaching the surface, he discharges the power he kept on reserve until then, a blowback of raw power circulating a whirlwind. A tornado twists the room apart as rapidly as it regrows its spikes. Chisaki roars as he releases a cataclysmic cascading counter to the air force. Spirals of spikes engage Mirio. Streaks of electricity jump from the blonde's back when he ducks down, one for all giving him yet another much-needed boost to outmaneuver his opponent's playground. Digging deeper and deeper into the tunnels, the two twist as much as they curve their way into combat. Each fighter tries to get a read on the other, their movements shift the tides of the ring in which they battle. 
Stone shreds into shrapnel and rains down from above. Mirio matches the Yakuza's moves with some fancy footwork and manages to evade every spear thrown his way. Training with Smentos during his early Yua school days helps Mirio with the simple stuff like stone shields. It's the trickier and much deadlier attacks Chisaki throws at him that pushes him past his limits. But he didn't become part of Japan's top hero academy Big 3 for nothing. Mirio catapults from another wave of the living ground, borrowing another teacher's skill set training to spring from the ceiling and rocket back down. He's no Gran Torino, but the swift switch up gets him closer to capturing Chisaki. Just a little further now, and he'll be within range. More barriers arise between him and his enemy. Okay, seriously, that move is getting kinda old. Mirio presses through them the same as the last round of walls. Except, he doesn't find Chisaki on the other side of them. Wah, he's too distracted by the Yakuza's absence to sense the floor shifting beneath his feet. Swallowing his legs and pulling him under faster than quicksand can sink a person, the young hero finds himself in a predicament with the ground. Looking for me, Chisaki emerges from an opening in the malleable material. He has one hand still maintaining contact with the tunnels, but his other is reaching forward. Mirio reacts on instinct, reeling away from the man's touch. While the young hero does avoid getting his face torn apart, he winds up trading his good looks for an arm. Chisaki uses his quirk, ripping the limb in various directions. Got you, the Yakuza is happy to see a bloody mess for the first time in a long time. Mirio tears himself away, losing only an arm, and saving the rest of his body. Not that he isn't in excruciating pain or completely horrified by the loss of a limb. He preserves his panic for later and instead pushes himself out of range from Chisaki with a burst of one for all. The damage is done and things only remain the same when Mirio is again bombarded by stone spires but he can see a light at the end of the tunnel. Literally, while that'd ordinarily be a bad thing, he'd like to believe this is a good sign. Since someone familiar is coming from it instead of pulling him towards it. Midoriya, Mirio releases a breath of relief that he wasn't aware was being held in until now. Though, that doesn't last long. The boy brought the girl that Chisaki wants with him. What are you doing here? He changes his mind when he realizes that they're basically playing right into Chisaki's hand so long as she's present. You look like you could use a hand. Izuku makes light of the sight he sees when Mirio is forced to block an attack with one arm. Though that joke could have probably used a better sense of timing. This was the only way to go, he explains the real reason why they wound be intercepting each other. Eri, Chisaki stalls in his flow of the fluctuating floor when he spots the little girl clinging to Izuku. Mirio uses that pause as a rare chance to gain an advantage and darts forward but the opportunity passes as quickly as it came. A platform carries the villain to a safe distance while spikes keep the young hero busy. So that's what this assault is about. You hope to take Eri away from me, the Yakuza leader redirects his glare from Mirio to Izuku. Remember how you brought me back to life, Izuku glances down at the girl in question. She shakily nods, too terrified to speak. He hopes the smile he offers her doesn't add to that fear but he's starting to feel a little feral as he reaches for the starter string on his sternum. It can do other things too, he pushes her back so that she doesn't get injured by his bladed transformation. Chainsaws cut themselves out from his flesh so that they can be used to protect her. Such a vile disease you have, Chisaki hisses with hatred when he witnesses the boys change into Chainsaw Man. The amount of bloodshed makes the Yakuza break out into hives. Actually, it's thanks to this quirk that I was cured of a disease, Izuku corrects the villain before rushing in to meet Chisaki's attack head-on. Chainsaws carve through stone, chipping away at the solid surface. Mirio grinds his boots into the ground, gaining traction. Before Izuku can get impaled by a spire much faster than he is, the young hero vaults from the floor and whisks his ally out of harm's way. The two land near the girl named Eri, standing between her and Chisaki. You need to get her out of here, Mirio uses the back of his hand to wipe sweat from his forehead while trying to recuperate. Izuku does a double take, surprised by what he just heard. And leave you to fight this guy alone. Don't you want my help? He parries an incoming spike of stone to prove his point. But that was just one. There's a plenude of others darting down at him. Mirio moves the boy and the girl away, a bumpy ride being carried by one arm, but they evade the shower of spikes. Not really, his voice breaks as he coughs out blood, you're kinda getting in the way more than helping, and Izuku can't argue with that, 
surprised to see the guy fend off another attack with a whole arm missing. Fine, Izuku admits he's not going to be much help in this situation and focuses on Eri, but you'd better not die on me. He retracts the chainsaws on his arms so that he can carry her to safety. That would be pretty bad, wouldn't it? Mirio mutters under his breath a final joke before turning to face Chisaki. It's time that he gets serious. One for all circulates through his entire system, accelerating to as high a level as his body can currently handle. Stone surges as Mirio's power does, meeting in the middle. Fishes sprout from the surface upon impact. Debris drags behind All Might's successor as he flies forwards. Chisaki throws up a round of rocks, hoping to slow the assault. However, he achieves the opposite effect, granting Mirio a spring system to ricochet from. Last minute barriers mean nothing either. Mirio smashes the stone shields to smithereens. Izuku carries Eri up onto a ledge where the tunnel isn't being controlled. Enough rubble has accolated to create a hill for them to climb while simultaneously providing cover for their escape. Until a minor quake shakes their mountain, causing a small landslide. The blowback from the battle between Mirio and Chisaki gives away the position when they tumble back down to the bottom of the hall. Chisaki redirects his attack to be a spiral of spikes heading in the direction of Izuku and Eri. Mirio stalls in his charge, shifting to fly back and save them. A race between the hero and the Yakuza leads to a stalemate. Mirio forces himself between the spires and his allies, taking the brunt of the blow. Without permeation, he's stabbed all across his body. More blood is shed than there was before. Fool, Chisaki presses his hands harder to the ground to give his spikes an added push. They spear through Mirio, extending to stab past the hero and towards the people behind him. He's stuck there, held in place. It was a worthless act of sacrifice. Izuku moves in front of Eri, re-releasing the chainsaws in his arms. Met with a violent volley of swings, the spikes are severed as fast as they come. I thought you weren't gonna worry about us. Gooo, Izuku urges Mirio to abandon them despite the amount of strain it takes for him to keep up with Chisaki's wave of spires. Realizing he has no choice but to charge ahead, Mirio nods, giving it his all. He phases through the spikes pinning him down so that he can be free to move again. And with a return to formula, uses one for all to pursue Chisaki. The Yakuza carries himself out of range with more ground manipulation. You get back here, but Mirio presses on by pumping his legs even faster. He channels only his strength, abandoning permeation for his final rush. Spikes jut out from below and above. One rips away a part of his left ear. Another nicks under his right armpit. Mirio yells at the top of his lungs while enduring every laceration from Chisaki's gauntlet. Until he's finally able to deal his own blow. A punch intended to blast the Yakuza away. Smash. The single fist shatters stone in pursuit for its target. A gunshot rings out. Mirio's fist stops short, an inch from colliding with Chisaki's face. Silence overtakes the remains of the room. Mirio's eyes expand as they stare ahead in shock. The Yakuza stares back, eyes equally broadened, when they begin to glaze over and close, only does the silence break by Chisaki choking on his own blood. Red spreads from the bullet hole in the villain's chest. Behind him, stands Sir Naitaye with a smoking pistol. Naitaye surprisingly collapses first. It takes Mirio shoving past Chisaki to topple the Yakuza. Sir. Mirio drops down at his mentor's side. He can see the hero is suffering from a fatal gunshot wound of his own. Tears well in Mirio's eyes as he applies pressure to the injury, he knows it's a vain effort to stop the bleeding but tries anyways. Your arm, Naitaye is as concerned as his protege when he sees the young hero is missing a limb. Not to mention all of the other severe injuries that he has. There's a lapse of judgment in which Naitaye wants to look into Mirio's future to ensure All Might's successor still even has one. Almost as though on cue, the villain from before returns to try and end it early. Chisaki springs forward from the ground, reaching for Mirio with his hands. He's screaming bloody murder with an intent to murder. His yell transitions to one of torment. Izuku steps in, swinging a chainsaw down to hack away at Chisaki's arms, the killing parts are severed at the elbow. The Yakuza hits the ground for good this time, his empire toppling with him. I really hate that guy, Izuku has half a mind to saw off more body parts than just that but restrains himself for Eri's sake. The little girl has returned to clinging onto his leg for dear life that he needs to retract his chainsaws again. 
Mirio stares, stuck in a stupor. He breaks out of it by blinking, confirming what he just saw was indeed real. Thanks for the save, his breathless voice matches his body when he finally allows himself to relax. Looks like it wasn't enough, but Izuku isn't quite as put at ease. He's looking past Mirio, at All Might's former sidekick. The man is dying. No. Naitae agrees. He reaches for them, straining to speak. Makima mustn't have the girl, what he says when they draw closer is enough to shake them all to the core. Huh. Izuku is barely able to speak either. She must have known about this, all of it. Mirio shares a look with Izuku as Naitae pauses to cough. She knew what would happen if we went in short supplied. You think she wanted this? Mirio has a hard time believing a hero association would be so underhanded. But when he looks at Izuku who's an agent of said association, he can see that the boy isn't quite as unconvinced by Naitai's accusation. The only people to know about this operation are eliminated during an op that's off the record and she gets Eri as a result, Izuku begins breaking down the same thought process that Naitai must be having in his final moments. There's no way to confirm the theory but he has to admit it's a possibility as he says, maybe. So what do we do? Mirio can't see any light within the devastation of the underground tunnels anymore as he looks up with despair. Naitae turns his head to face Izuku, bloodshot eyes settling on the blood-soaked boy. You're the reason that child has a future, the hero reaches for Izuku with a shaky hand, allow me to please see yours. Izuku reels back at first, hesitant, but ultimately accepts the outstretched hand. He leans into the touch, allowing Naitae to place a palm against his chest. Near or far, what the hero sees drains all life from his eyes. It's unknown if his skin turns pale from terror or blood loss. Maybe Naitae saw Pokita's future and not Izuku's. No matter the case, one thing's for certain. Mirei Sasaki has no words to convey his vision. There's no warning he can give. All he has to offer is death as he gives his life in the end. Sir, Mirio hunches over as he cradles the corpse of his dead mentor. Izuku hangs his head, placing a hand on Eri's head to turn it away from the body. That will be all for this video, be sure to like, subscribe, share, and comment down below for more videos, goodbye.